Phoenix Theatre here in Phoenix Street. Often one of the West End sort of overlooked theatres, this. It's a real little beauty though, isn't it? It's another really beautiful day. Actually, I say another, because I realised the last video it was grey and horrible, but today it's gorgeous and it's really mild and warm, even though I've just bought myself a, a new beanie for the cold weather. But today, we're gonna, we're gonna go down here, down Charing Cross Road. What's interesting is you can talk to yourself on camera now, walking through crowds of people, and no one really pays much attention. Sort of like, not a particularly unusual thing. I mean, they do look a little bit. You'll see that more than I will, because they'll be doing it after they walk past me, but that's not what this video is about. So we're just actually gonna go for a bit of a, a stroll through the West End. We're gonna go down Charing Cross Road here, and then we're gonna go across Trafalgar Square, and down the Mall to St James's Park. If we've got enough daylight or whatever, we might um, do a bit of high park, but I don't think so, because it's three o'clock. I just love it, it's just such a beautiful day to be in the West End. Look, look down Old Compton Street. And this whole uh, alternate thing at the top of Charing Cross Road is come to life now. I still don't really understand what it is. It seems to be like a digital gallery which seems like an odd thing to have knocked down all those buildings behind um, Denmark Street for, but, well, there you go. Such a beautiful day, and it'd be so easy to get sidetracked from the stated intention that I've already laid out to go off these side streets, but I must try and stick to a little bit of the course, or do we allow ourselves to drift? Maybe we abandon these half-made plans. Litchfield Street here is a great little street, isn't it? Look, there are these flats down here that look like they might be Peabody flats or something, some sort of uh, so housing association. And just, uh, just down Litchfield Street, a little way off Charing Cross Road, is this great little place, Le Beaujolais. I've never actually been here. I really want to go there. We went to go there with, with Heidi a couple of weeks ago after we went to the Curzon, but it was it's sort of like communal tables almost. It's tiny upstairs. There's a private dining club downstairs, if you remember. But the upstairs, it just looks like such a great vibe in there. I really want to go sometime. I think it's been in the same um, group of people, same French people, for a long time. I think I, I'll try and find the date and put it on the screen, but it's a really authentic kind of French bistro place. Anyone been there? Any advice, any tips? This massive queue here isn't for one of Charing Cross's famous bookshops, although there are fewer bookshops now than there's ever been. I think it's for bubble tea, whatever aberration that is. The words bubble and tea don't belong together, do they? Actually, I don't think it is bubble tea. I think it's, I don't know, I think it's a Japanese bakery type place. It's called Bun Sick. And of course, this is the real deal. Any amount of books great bookshop. They have some fantastic books in here. And the porcupine over there is rammed, but I think it's people that have been at the Cenotaph. I see lots of people wearing medals, because today is Remembrance Sunday, of course. Um, I won't visit the Cenotaph, because I think it's a bit mawkish, perhaps, to take a photograph or video with that on Remembrance Sunday. But um, that's an interesting sight, isn't it? Chinatown, just over the road. And Leicester Square, just over the road there. I won't attempt to go across Leicester Square because look, it looks rammed. This is interesting, isn't it? Because it's so unseasonally worn today. And there's just so many people in the West End. S Cecil Court, which is a great street of antiquarian book dealers. Um, this is featured in a video that I made almost exactly two years ago on a walk through the West End in a very different time, really. This is the way that change kind of damages memory, doesn't it? The Amorino here, this ice cream bar, very nice ice creams, may I say. I think that was Gabby's, wasn't it? The famous falafel place, Gabby's Deli. I have a feeling that's where it was. A lot of people rated that as the best little kind of sandwich bar falafel place in the West End. The Garrick Theatre, a place that will always have a very special place in my heart. This is where, um, this is the first West End Theatre that I worked in when I just answered an ad in the paper one day and I got a job in the, working in the bars and um, yeah I would say it changed my life actually that day. 
Ended up working in the West End theatre bars for about a, a year and a half nearly. I really clearly remember coming out and sitting on that balcony up there. It was a summer with a gin and tonic after the show had started. So we'd done the pre-show drinks. Everyone went in and I didn't know what to do. And the person I was working with in the bar just said, here you go, get yourself a gin and tonic and go and sit out there. And we just sat out there drinking, overlooking Charing Cross Road from that balcony. And it was astonishing. I was like, oh, what? This is a life that people live. And all the people that were there were actors and writers and musicians. And it was such a, a wonderful environment to be in. St Martin's in the Fields, one of the great London churches, central London churches I should say. Lovely cafe in the crypts there. So there's this kind of Christmas market thing here at Trafalgar Square, which I didn't realise was here. It looks like it's a little, you know, I feel bad saying this, but it looks a little bit half-hearted, doesn't it? Trafalgar Square. This is London's main central gathering spot, I would say. Lots of things go on here. And actually, since it was, was laid out in the 1840s, it's been a, a kind of, you know, a mustering place for sometimes for quite radical events, demonstrations, big displays, also big, big public kind of celebrations as well. And it continues that, that role in London's, in London's life. But one, one thing I haven't been able to find actually online, the source for this, so I'm just going to say it spuriously and you can call me out in the comments, but I did read somewhere as well that the heritage of uh, this area, what would have been fields here basically, um, goes way, way, way back as a, as a kind of place of free association where you were free to come here and, and voice your concerns about the state of the nation and the state of the world. And that is why you still have the right to kind of come here and gather in a way that you maybe don't in other parts of the capital. And of course, it's, you know, named after the Battle of Trafalgar of 1805, where, where Nelson led Britain to a great victory. And there he is up there on the top of Nelson's column. I always feel like it's a bit much in it. Like there were other people at the Battle of Trafalgar who, you know, played a very important role in that victory. It wasn't just Nelson. He didn't win on his own, did he? but he's the only one on the top of that plinth. Apparently, Nelson never said, kiss me, Hardy. That's one of those sort of made up last lines. I don't know what his last words were. Probably, ah, that really hurts. So Ed Glynnett tells us in his essential London compendium that there's a, there's a government bunker beneath Nelson's column, which is where the government installed a telephone exchange in the 50s to uh, help deal with the possibility of a nuclear war. Also in the London Compendium, Ed Glynnett writes how Hitler saw Nelson's column as a great symbol of, of British naval might and of world domination, and that consequently he thought it would be an amazing symbol of German victory to take Nelson's column and move it to Berlin. It's said that that's why it wasn't bombed. I've read other things about things like that. They weren't that accurate, the bombing in the war. They didn't, you know, they just bombed entire areas and hoped for the best. So, they, so I think it's more of a fluke that they miss uh, Nelson's column more than uh, plans, you know, preparing for its relocation to Berlin. And of course, Edwin Landseer's lions here are, are also one of the great symbols of Nelson's column. And I love the fact that, that it was modelled on a, on a dead lion from uh, Regent's Park Zoo, now London Zoo, that was taken to his studio in St John's Wood. Like a lot of Londoners, I rarely come to Trafalgar Square. When I do, I think, oh my God, it's, it's amazing. It is great. I love the fact as well that this was the site of a, of a prison where royalist captives were held by the parliamentarians. And apparently every year on the 30th of January, it's where royalists come to commemorate Charles I on, I think it was the date of his execution, the anniversary of his execution. And now we've got Charles III. And we mustn't forget there on the far side, dominating one whole side of Trafalgar Square, we have the wonderful National Gallery. What a magnificent institution that is. 
the plinths around the edge of Trafalgar Square have the usual kind of, you know, lords and generals on them. I can't remember the fourth one was, I think it was intended for a statue of William IV that was never installed. So now it hosts artworks. I don't know whose piece of work that is. I will have to look it up and put it on the screen, but it's an interesting place that, and it does start a, can occasionally start a kind of conversation around what's there. Looking down Whitehall there towards the Cenotaph, where the, the wreaths would have been laid this morning on Remembrance Sunday. And of course, at the end, you have the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben and, and all that. I'll link below to a video I made actually inside the Houses of Commons when I was the guest of an MP there. I, I don't know what it is about the big national monuments that does bring out the kind of iconoclast in me. And that might be why I haven't done a lot of these kind of like very obviously heritagey central London locations, which are amazing places and they are very important places in their part of the story of, a very important part of the story of London. But I suppose my big thing like with my book, This Other London, Adventures in the Overlooked City, was about showing that actually these narratives exist all around London. It's just we happen to focus on this central area, probably because it's the seat of power, isn't it? Westminster, Buckingham Palace, the Royal Family and all that. But it's amazing. The West End and all this stuff is incredible. And they are great stories. And I think what we'll do now is we'll go down the Mall and we'll get to Buckingham Palace. I don't know if we'll get to St James's Park in the light or not, though, but let's give it a go, eh? And here is Admiralty Arch, a triumphal arch. It's built in 1911 to commemorate Queen Victoria. And of course, it's the gateway to Buckingham Palace and from Buckingham Palace to Trafalgar Square. The Mall, look at this. It's incredible, isn't it? This, this boulevard was cut through, right through St. James's Park in 1660 for Charles II just to play games on. What kind of games would you need something like this? I'm not entirely sure. But um, it pretty soon, by the, it fell into kind of, you know, a place of, a place of uh, ill repute, haunted by prostitutes and robbers. And it wasn't actually kind of cleaned up until the 20th century. And of course, what you get when you walk through this central part of London, really, is I think quite subtly, but it's present, is military London, because of course, as the centre of government, the heart of government, the heart of, you know, the state, the very heart of the state is here, of course you have to have people to defend it, and there are barracks around this area, some more visible than others, Horse Guards Parade down there, you've got the, you know, you've got the guards are based here, and there's lots of other things less obvious. Like there's a series of tunnels that run beneath the Mall linking Buckingham Palace to the various government institutions over there in Whitehall so that either the monarch doesn't have to go at street level to government and likewise government officials can visit the palace without having to go through the streets where they might be harangued and held to account. I mean you wouldn't want that would you? Usually the only reason I come to the Mall, in fact actually the only reason I ever come to the Mall is to come here to the Institute of Contemporary Arts, the ICA. Although I haven't been here for a few years actually. They did screen my film um, Make Your Own Damn Art there, which was a wonderful moment. And it's been, in the past, it was quite considered quite a radical place. They did some quite shocking things in the 60s and 70s that kind of offended the tabloid press, but I don't think anyone really pays a lot of attention anymore. I think it'd be very difficult to shock anybody now, wouldn't it? St. James's Park, which for many years I would have said was my favorite London park. I don't think I really have one now, actually, from my you know, favorite London open spaces like Wanstead Park and Wanstead Flats. But it is a really beautiful park and it's kind of often overlooked, isn't it, in favor of the bigger parks like Hyde Park and Regent's Park, but it's really glorious. It was actually created in, in the 1530s by Henry VIII and is London's first royal park and then opened to the public by Charles II in the 1660s. Again, dipping into the London Compendium. I mention this book a lot and people then often say in the comments that it's very hard to get hold of now. I don't know why, come on, Penguin. Just bring out another big, nice paperback like this. Anyway, um, what Ed Glynnett tells us about St James's Park is that um, apparently there were no powers of arrest here 
um, even as late as the 18th century. So it became obviously a real kind of haven for ne'er-do-wells, robbers and vagabonds. And apparently there was a notorious gang that plagued St. James's Park called the Mohawks, the Mohawks, who accosted people with swords. That's kind of incredible, isn't it? It was later kind of cleaned up and made into the park that you see today. Um, I think it was Charles II who imported gondolas to be put in the lake here because he wanted to kind of create like a little Venice, which is a lovely idea. I don't think it worked very well, but the, the, the lake and the little cafe there um, are real treasures. That cafe it used to be one of the kind of better London Park cafes. I'm going back. <laughs> My memory of that is like 30 years ago when I, that's where I take my mum, basically. There's lots of really nice London Park cafes now. Can you hear the band from over there on uh, Horse Guards? Wow, it's kind of loud. That must be for uh, Remembrance Sunday. Good on them. I feel like there is a, a natural conclusion to this walk straight ahead. It's kind of inevitable, isn't it? Buckingham Palace, home of the, uh, the British monarchy since 1762. Trivia question, where was their London home before then? I think Palace of Westminster, maybe? Prior to that, it'd been a kind of very marshy area, a big area of fields where James I had attempted to grow uh, black mulberry trees to produce silk to start a, an English silk industry and of course it didn't really uh, take off I think it's because he bought the wrong type of mulberry tree and there still are some James the first mulberries dotted around London a few survivors here obviously I wonder if it's actually in the, in the grounds of Buckingham Palace that'd be interesting wouldn't it there was a big grove of mulberry trees and of course the marshy land here was created by both the Tyburn flowing through which I think is more or less where I'm stood now, I think, runs through here and then further to the west behind Buckingham Pass would be the Westbourne stream as well. And then at some point the, uh, the Earl of Norwich built a house here, that burnt down. Then the Earl of Buckingham built a house here, or the Duke of Buckingham, can't remember which, some noble with Buckingham in his name, built a place called Buckingham House that then came into the possession of the monarchy who then completely tore it down and built this great big lump here which is where they still reside today. Well, thank you for joining me on that slightly unexpected central London stroll down Charing Cross Road over Trafalgar Square down the Mall here to Buckingham Palace and taking in one of my favourite central London parks. It's really, really, it's, there's some magic in the air tonight. I can feel it. There's a real, there's something, there's something here. It's uh, frisson in the air. Well, thanks again. Thanks to my wonderful supporters on Patreon. And as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you in the next walk, wherever that may be. And I'll be honest with you, like I did actually want to go and finish off the River Quaggy walk today, and I just kind of run out of time to do it. So I, I'd like that to be the next walk, but who knows? I might completely change my mind, get a kind of real pang to go somewhere else and head off there. So take care. I'm going to go and have a look and see what's on at the ICA, I think. Have a great week.